I'm Vinny Politan. Thanks so much for joining us here tonight on Closing Arguments as we continue our coverage from Minneapolis, Minnesota of the case against Derek Chauvin, the man accused of murdering George Floyd. Um, in this case, the most viable defense for former officer Chauvin is going to be cause of death. I mean, it's going to be extremely difficult to convince this jury or perhaps any of the jurors that the nine minutes and 29 seconds uh, that his knee was on George Floyd's neck and on his back and he was restrained was reasonable under the circumstances, especially when George Floyd has gone motionless and when uh, medics arrive, he's dead. I mean, it, it's going to be difficult to say that was reasonable use of force, reasonable police procedures, reasonable restraint. It's going to be impossible. Cause of death is going to be what this case is about for the defense. And when you talk about cause of death, there are several factors the defense is going to put in play. One of the biggest will be drugs, the fentanyl, the methamphetamine that was found in the toxicology report, uh, the evidence of George Floyd uh, ingesting drugs that the defense uh, believes they have in this case, the, the evidence of George Floyd ingesting drugs at another arrest back in 2019. All of that uh, will be huge. But today, during the prosecution's case, the prosecution's case, remember, we're not in the defense case yet, we're in the prosecution's case, the jury heard about George Floyd's drug addiction, drug problems, drug use. And it all came from his girlfriend who took the stand. It was my biggest moment of the day. Both Floyd and I, our, our, our story, uh, it's, it's a classic story of uh, how many people get addicted to opioids. We both suffered from chronic pain. Mine was in my neck and his was in his back. We both um, had prescriptions, but um, after the prescriptions uh, that were filled and uh, we, 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 we got addicted and, and tried really hard to uh, break that addiction. So there were times when you would obtain uh, non-prescription uh, opiate pills together? Yes, they would be, be other people's prescriptions. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. They would be other people's prescriptions. And were there sometimes, well, why would you get them through other people's prescriptions? What do you mean? To make sure they were safe. And were there times then that you had to get pills other than you know, from what you knew were somebody else's prescriptions? Yes. Okay. I think when you know someone who suffers with any type of addiction, you can start to kind of see changes when they're using again. And there's just slight behavioral changes that I noticed in him, and it just made me suspect. You spent several days with him at the hospital, correct? Yes. And did you learn what that what caused that overdose? No. Okay. At that time frame, did you learn that Mr. Floyd was taking anything other than opioids? No. Okay. You, you did not know that he had taken heroin at that time? No. All right, let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Julie Janae, who joins us live from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And... Um, there's a lot of things that she testified to. I want to focus first on, on this part because I think this directly impacts uh, the defense's only viable uh, argument here in front of this jury, which is cause of death and drugs will be part of it. Uh, the picture that was painted today, what's the overall picture that this jury is getting of George Floyd and his drug use? You know, they're really understanding him as a person. She's the first person to get on the stand and really talk about who he was behind the scenes. It was very revealing in how they learned about George Floyd today. And she also talked about this struggle that they had and being able to have that perspective that it was a joint struggle. We had this addiction and we both worked to try and get clean. It was off and on, uh, but really showing this jury something that the defense does want to get in front of them. And that is that March 2020 
overdose hospitalization where she says she drove George Floyd to the hospital and he was suffering from stomach pain. He had white foam in the corners of his mouth and she didn't know directly about what he overdosed on or what the medical diagnosis was, but that was what the defense wanted to get in front of them, was that this was a person who just a few months before he died under Derek Chauvin's knee was someone who overdosed and had to be hospitalized due to drugs. Inside the, the, the courtroom, um, this, you know, you, you watch as she was testifying, this was not an easy day for her, for Courtney Ross to be in there. Number one, George Floyd um, was someone she was with for quite some time. This is about his death. This is the trial of the man accused of his murder. Um, and, and, and she really, it, it seemed like she was able to tell a, a story and, and paint a picture that seems so real. I'm trying to put words into the way she testified because to me it was so gripping because it wasn't, she wasn't fighting with anyone. She was just kind of like releasing this information. It was not combative at all. She was so pleasant on the stand, whoever was questioning her, whether it was the prosecution or the defense. And I think that level of, of niceness really on the stand, she said good afternoon or good morning to Eric Nelson in a way that you felt that she didn't have any animosity towards him as the man representing Derek Chauvin. Uh, but I think that helped her to seem more genuine. Now, what I know about Courtney Ross and the interviews that we've done and talking to people, I've spoken to a spokesperson or someone who was communicating with her. I know that she has shied away from interviews and media attention in this case. She doesn't want to get any uh, fame or glory for how she was connected to George Floyd. And uh, she's just been watching this and taking it in. So this is one of the times, the only times that she has really put her entire story on what she knows and who she knows George Floyd to be. Uh, out in the public venue, but you don't see that many nerves. You really just see her releasing and breaking down several times, but regaining that composure and testifying just about everything, not seeming to try to hide anything at all. Yeah, it came across as very genuine and, and, and truthful, which is important, right? This is a trial. That's what we're trying to get to. Um, how about George Floyd's family? You've got testimony coming out today, a lot of talk about drugs. Uh, any reaction from the family or their attorneys today? There was a statement that was put out shortly after this testimony from Courtney Ross. Uh, the attorneys who represent the family in the civil suit, uh, Antonio Romanucci and Benjamin Crump, they said as the defense attempts to construct this narrative that George Floyd's cause of death was the fentanyl in his system, we want to remind the world who was witnessing this death on video that George was walking, talking, laughing and breathing just fine before Derek Chauvin held his knee to George's neck, blocking his ability to breathe and extinguishing his life for all to see. And it goes on to say that uh, uh, that we uh, tens of thousands of Americans struggle with self-medication and opioid abuse and are treated with dignity, respect and support, not brutality. We fully expect the defense to put George's character and struggles with addiction on, on trial because that is the go-to tactic when the facts are not on your side. They also said that we are confident that the jury will see past this to arrive at the truth that George would have lived to see another day if Derek Chauvin hadn't brutally ended his life in front of a crowd of witnesses pleading for his life. And that just echoes what the family of George Floyd has said from the beginning. They haven't shied away from the fact that he had a struggle with drug abuse, but they are hoping the public and especially this jury focus on what happened on May 25th when Derek Chauvin's knee was on his neck and not his struggles in the past. All right, let's uh, bring into the conversation our special guest joining us, civil rights attorney, former Court TV anchor, my former co-anchor, Lisa Bloom, back with us, and criminal defense attorney, civil rights attorney, also former Court TV anchor, anchor uh, Ron Kuby. Um, Lisa, um, it, what do you think all of the testimony about the drugs here, what's going on? Is, is this the foundation for the arguments regarding cause of death? Or is this uh, going to be used to attempt to undermine and assassinate the character of the victim, George Floyd? Well, the defense is clearly victim blaming and trying to make George Floyd out to be this scary, terrible drug user. And so it was very smart for the prosecution to preempt all of that by putting on a very sympathetic witness, the girlfriend, to talk about her own struggles with opioid addiction and George Floyd's struggles with opioid addiction. And you know, who among us doesn't know somebody who struggles 
with addiction if we don't have that struggle ourselves. So I think it was a very smart move by the prosecution to preempt all of that, to humanize him. Yes, he may have had some struggles, but he's still a human being who was obviously very much loved by his girlfriend. I, I think this was just a home run for the prosecution today. Rob, what's the impact of the, the testimony and evidence regarding George Floyd and his struggles with drugs? Uh, from my perspective today, uh, I agree with everything that's been said. This witness was incredibly sympathetic. She painted a, a picture of a joint struggle to overcome addiction with its high points and, and its low points. Of course, I'm old enough to remember a time in the 80s and 90s when crack addiction, which was primarily a, a problem in the in the African American urban communities, was thought of as a sign of grave moral weakness, and crack addicts were were thought of people who would murder their own mothers for two dollars. Once the opioid crisis hit us, which is still primarily uh, a, a, an affliction of the white communities, it suddenly has become medicalized, and now we're all sympathetic. To, to people who are struggling with substance abuse. That, that's a step forward, uh, and, and I think it's fantastic. So I don't think the drug issue is going to have any effect on this jury because, as Lisa said, we all know, and certainly everybody on that jury knows somebody who struggled with substance abuse. Now, another part of the testimony of Courtney Ross was about the relationship with George Floyd. Um, let's take a listen to that testimony because that, again, gives a, a different picture of, of the man who is the victim in this case. Miss Ross, did you know um, George Floyd? Yes. When did you meet George Floyd? I met Floyd in August of 2017. And you refer to him as Floyd? All the time. And so what, when was it that you first met Mr. Floyd? May I tell the story? Sure. Okay. Uh, it's one of my favorite stories to tell. I was pretty upset, and I started kind of fussing in the corner of the lobby. And uh, at one point, <laughs> Floyd came up. To to me. And uh, Floyd has this great, deep, southern voice, raspy. And he's like, sis, you okay, sis? And I wasn't okay. I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting for my son's father. <laughs> Sorry. He said, um, I said, well, can I pray with you? I thought I was so tired. We had been through so much, my sons and I. And this kind person just to come up to me and say, can I pray with you? When I felt alone in this lobby, it was so sweet. <laughs> Afterwards, um, he had asked me who my son's father was. And I said, you know, we're, we're, we're co-parent and we're, um, we're not in a relationship. And that's when his I like to say his voice dropped like two levels, even though it was deep already. And he, he asked me um, if he could get my number. And we had our first kiss in the lobby. And that's when our relationship started. Um, up until his death, did you continue to be in a relationship with him? Yes. Can you describe you know, how, how close you, how often you saw each other during those three years? Uh, just about every day. We saw each other as much as we possibly could. You and Floyd, Mr. Floyd, excuse me, I'm assuming like most couples had pet names for each other. Yeah. And what was his name for you? I mean, what were you saved? Let me strike that. What were you saved in his phone as? 
Mama. Julie Janae, Court TV legal correspondent in Minneapolis. Um, I just want to start with that last part there from the cross examination. Um, it seemed that was she seemed reluctant, or how, how did you read her response to that question? Well, I just think that she felt sad remembering what he used to say to her. That's the demeanor she had throughout when she really seemed to think back on him or see his picture. But you could tell that the defense attorney was trying to insinuate that perhaps the mama that we hear on the video, that he's not talking to her. But later in that cross-examination, uh, she that he's not talking to his own mother, rather, uh, she says that, look, he called me mama, but in a different way. That was a pet name. He, she could tell when he was talking about his mother's. I don't think Nelson scored any points trying to make that insinuation, but uh, she did seem sad talking about things that were very personal about their relationship. But again, seemed like a very genuine witness. Yeah. Lisa, this was a, a much different picture that the jury will get of George Floyd, right? We've got all these videos, and, and that's a, a horrendous day. He's in pain. He's in handcuffs. All of that. Here we got to hear what George Floyd was like on other days, you know, the, 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 and now the rest of the story. Yes, absolutely. And she is a magnificent witness. If I'm the prosecutor, I want her to stay on the stand as long as possible. I am surprised the defense asked her any questions at all. The defense should have stood up and said, thank you. I'm sorry for your loss. Goodbye. Next witness. There's no nothing to be gained from cross-examining her. I also thought it was very interesting in the first part of the clip that you just showed how she kind of went on and on with her story, which from a storytelling point of view was very good. From a trial point of view, you know, witnesses are not supposed to do that. They're not supposed to testify in a narrative. It's very uncomfortable for the defense, I think, to object. I wonder if the judge kind of gave the prosecutor a look, and that's why he said, uh, you know, let me let me jump in and, and ask you something. If I may, it's very difficult when you have a witness who does that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ron Kuby, at least makes a great point about uh, how the defense sort of sitting back, not wanting to uh, disrupt what she was saying. But a lot of what she was saying uh, is incredibly helpful to prosecutors. And I think mm -hmm. kind of unusual in, in, a, in a case like this. We've seen a lot of unusual things uh, in the George Floyd murder case, and and that's right. Generally, you would not uh, permit a witness to go on at this length and in this depth with things that are really not really central to the issue of of whether or not Chauvin is guilty or or or, or will be found not guilty. Uh, so it's not the first we've seen of that. It won't be the last. But but I think we sort of misunderstand what a defense win is here. I, I think everybody watching this case believes it is extremely unlikely that the jury will acquit Chauvin on all counts. So what does a defense win look like? A defense win is either a mistrial with some time so Chauvin can take a plea or a conviction on the least serious count of second degree manslaughter, which requires a finding of, of culpable criminal negligence and inherently dangerous acts. Uh, and if you want to think that's a prosecutorial win, you can. But given the sentencing guidelines, Chauvin gets convicted of that. Um, he gets uh, he ends up doing about two and a half years and he's back out on the street. That's the big win. So if the defense can get that, that's a huge win. Absolutely. Way to put everything in perspective.